Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. A very very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing absolutely fine. It's the beginning of a new week. It's a Monday and we are back once again with the Hindu news paper analysis. Very happy to see most of you join here right on time at 10 a.m. I hope that all of you have been taking advantage of our Target Prelims 2023 initiative ongoing on our YouTube channel. Today will be the last class of the Target Prelims 2023. Make sure that you attend this class. This will be on the important places in news. Map based questions, also a lot of important physical and other attributes of the places that are in the news. Make sure that you join in for this session as well. This will be live at 7.30 p.m. Just in case you have not been able to attend any of the earlier sessions, you can always do that by going to a YouTube channel and going through the playlist of the Target Prelims 2023. So please make sure you do not miss out on any of these sessions, especially if you are appearing for this year's prelims examination on 28th of May. These are the topics that we have taken up for discussion today. We will be starting our discussion with India's decision not to become a part of RCEP, but becoming a part of other regional groupings. So the author here is discussing how exactly can India leverage different types of trade organizations. Second, there's an article written on the nutritional value of millets, a topic that we have discussed earlier as well. We will be discussing in much more detail about how millets hold a lot of nutritional value. Then we'll be discussing about how can a baby have three parents? It was in the news recently, recently a baby is born in UK, the baby with three parents. So what exactly is the contour of a three parent baby? How does it work? We'll be discussing that. Then from the pillars point of view, there are three important topics. Number one, government has released a fourth positive indigenization list, meaning that the government has again released a list under which we will see that the government of India will not buy certain types of weapons from outside India. We will only have it within our country. Then the center government has announced a new CBI director. So we'll be discussing how that works, the appointment of the CBI director. What is the process? Is there any important Supreme Court case regarding that? And in the end, the Supreme Court has yet again added one more thing under Article 21. As you know, Article 21 has been expanded quite a lot by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court now has said that if the bail order given by a court is extremely long and it is too late, it also can be a ground for violation of personal liberty. So these are the things that we'll be discussing today without waiting any further. Let's see what are the topics for today. So the first topic that we have is India's decision not to join the RCEP, but to become a part of IPEF. Now let's try and understand what exactly is this. Let's start with RCEP. Now RCEP, as you remember, was a free trade agreement centered around the ASEAN countries. So the ASEAN countries, apart from the ASEAN countries, there were six other countries, including India, that were discussing a free trade agreement. However, at the end stage, India did not become a part of it. RCEP thus is ASEAN and five other countries, which does not include India. The reason why India did not join it was that one of these five countries was China. India did not want to be a part of a free trade agreement with China as well in that, because we do not want Chinese products coming in and flooding Indian market. On the other hand, what happened was India joined another kind of an agreement called the IPEF. The IPEF, as you know, stands for Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. This is an agreement which has a lot of common countries as the RCEP. The difference is it doesn't have China. It doesn't have China, but it has the US. So IPEF is not centered around China. It has USA as the main country. Apart from this, on the, on the other hand, IPEF is not really a free trade agreement. Please understand what exactly are free trade agreements. Free trade agreements are those where the countries, the member nations have agreed that we will not put tariffs on each other's products or services. Or even if we will put tariff, it will be very, very low. That is what the free trade agreement is. It's about reducing tariff, reducing taxes, etc. On the other hand, the IPEF is not necessarily about tariff. 
it's mostly about collaborating with each other making sure we get access to each other's market making sure that the supply chain becomes more robust so you cannot call the ipef as a proper free trade agreement it will not really focus a lot on reducing tariffs now as your author says <clears throat> rcep has china japan south korea australia new zealand that is five of these and the asean there was a question asked on the rcep about a couple of years back so please do remember about that as well as i said india was a part of the negotiations till the very last day but when it came to the final signing india said we will not sign it the major reason was presence of china because if china and india both of these countries are a part of a common free trade agreement that means india will have to provide access to chinese products without high tariffs or almost zero tariffs which we do not want we do not want chinese products to be dumped into india india on the other hand joined the ip yeah we did discuss about that also a few months back now even if we have become a part of ipef it's not that we don't have anything to fear from us from us also we do have certain issues for example if you have realized this india if you go back a few years india usually did not sign many free trade agreements the reason why india avoided free trade agreements was india was never sure of our agriculture sector india has always been very careful that whenever we sign a free trade agreement we do not want our agriculture sector to come into a lot of pressure because we think if foreign products come into our country especially in the agriculture sector indian agriculture indian farmers will not be able to actually compete with them this is where the problem starts in this agreement also the ipef india is still concerned about how will it impact our agriculture sector intellectual property environment standards etc the ipef as i said is not really a free trade agreement it's more of economic partnership the ipef has four main pillars to remember that the four main pillars are trade supply chain clean economy and fair economy these are the four main pillars india has not joined one of the pillars that is trade do make a note of this as well in the ipef india has not joined the trade pillar because again india is not sure how exactly would it impact our economy we have joined the supply chain the clean economy etc for supply chain more specifically the countries were worried because ever since the covid-19 pandemic hit the world supply chains originating from china taiwan etc were disrupted so it is an attempt by the other countries to come together have a supply chain of important products which do not originate from china the ipef this is how it looks except china these are the countries mainly which are a part of the ipef as you can see a lot of these countries are common in the rcep and the iepf but again please 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 understand the difference the ipef is not really a free trade agreement it will help in building more robust supply chains which are not entirely dependent on china it will help in clean energy it will help in promoting competition but it will not be focused on reducing tariff also i wanted to show you a clear comparison between the two so that you can be absolutely sure how these two are different if you can see rcep and iepf the important pointers one of the most important point see the tariff part in the tariff part the cons or the objective of rcep more than 90% of trade goods will eventually have zero tariff in ipef it does not involve opening up us market or lowering of tariff on the other hand if you see these two groups have also been mostly different when it comes to what the targets are the rcep wants to cancel import tariffs they also want to have rules for e-commerce trade etc over here the ipef is mostly focused on supply chain see in these kind of questions for the mains examination point of view you have to understand rcep iepf how these impact india for the prelims point of view you have to remember the members also make a note of the common members which are the members which are common in ipef and rcep so that both of these 
can be identified very easily. This was our first article for the day. Let me quickly take up, there are any few questions before we go ahead to the second one. Rahul is saying to stop the use of Chinese products, if we increase GST rate on that product, will it affect on sell or not? See, obviously people buy Chinese products because they are cost effective, as simple as that. But the problem is you can't randomly put taxes, it goes against WTO. So again, you cannot just randomly put taxes because it's coming from China. Earlier, we used to put anti-dumping duty on China, but now that can also not be put. So as a part of WTO, you can't just randomly put taxes. Kishan is saying in other aspects, we could get access to larger market, also increase competitiveness in the quality of product instead of exploration, attracted more investment. So Kishan, that is why India is now signing more free trade agreements. In the past few years, you have seen we have signed free trade agreements with the UAE, Australia, we are trying to sign one with UK as well, with EU as well. With China, the problem is of trust. We don't trust China to be open to all the information. That is the other problem with China. So it's not just about getting more access to the market. That is why we are signing trade agreements with other countries. The problem here specifically is with the China. Sort of clean economy means getting technology to have much cleaner production, reducing your emission, reducing your uh, pollution. This is what the idea of clean economy is. It's more about exchange of technology. Then uh, I have a question. Will India join trade pillar later in the future? I can't see the future. <laughs> I wish I could, but I can't see the future. So, <laughs> only the person who can see the future can tell you. Baljeet is saying 90% tariff relief is a massive tariff relief. So, why don't we join the RCEP? As I said, the problem we have with RCEP till the end stage was that we did not have enough trust in China. China, see, for any agreement to be successful, you need trust between the two countries. You need China to clearly tell us how did they make the product, what is their entire cost, because China historically has always been subsidizing their products. So for example, I'll give you an example what China does. So let's say China will tell their mobile phone companies that you don't have to give electricity bill. You don't have to give, let's say, uh, not just electricity bill, let's say you don't even have to give rent for the land. So what happens is in such cases, the cost of manufacturing the mobile phone will become much cheaper for that mobile company. So same mobile being made in India will cost 10,000 rupees. Same mobile phone made in China will cost 7,000 rupees because the government of China is interfering there. They are artificially lowering the cost by giving huge subsidies. This is the problem. Now when Chinese products come to India, an Indian consumer who is very price sensitive will always go for cheaper alternatives. This is the problem between India and China. That is why we don't trust China and the Chinese products coming in. Okay, let's go ahead then. The second, uh, okay, I, I think I gave you a question earlier. So I think there is uh, a couple of people asking this. Why is Tamil Nadu police in charge of security of Tihar jail? This was your, this was a homework that I gave you earlier. And I'm very sure just a Google search will give you the answer for this. So let's see if you can do that. If you can take five seconds of your precious time to do a Google search, you will be able to get to know. Okay, let's come back then. The second article that we have here is on millets. Now, in the past few months, we have discussed a lot of article on millets. It's not the first one, but this also has a lot of other interesting aspects which were not mentioned in the other articles. Millets, as you know, FAO, that is Food and Agriculture Organization, has declared 2023 as the international year of millets because of this millets has been in the news quite a lot there has been a lot of research done on millets the importance of millets now the reason why millets are extremely important for india is number one millets can be grown in those conditions as well where you do not have a lot of fertile soil or water so they are drought resistant most of them they don't require a lot of water so number one it is very 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 easy to grow them it doesn't require very specific set of climatic conditions second thing that works in favor of millets as most of you would know these are very nutritional 
Now, most of you, if you have, if you have had millets, I don't know how many of you have had millets, you might not, uh, I don't want to say you might not like the taste, but the taste is slightly different if you are used to eating wheat and rice. Because our population is mostly so dependent on wheat and rice, we don't really go towards millets. And we have not really developed a kind of a taste for millet. So those who do have millets, you may not like it initially, but it depends on how exactly is it made. It's slightly harder. It's slightly more rough as compared to wheat and rice. But the point is it is much, much more nutritional. It has much more fibers. It has much more of the micronutrients that you require as compared to wheat and rice. And that is why consuming millets is extremely important. Also, India, if we can make the entire world realize the importance of millets. India can benefit why? Because we are the largest producer of millets in the entire world. This is why India not just has to encourage people within our country to consume millets, we have to make it a habit worldwide. Because once the people start realizing that millets are important, it can act as one of things that India can exchange in, or India can export in large numbers. Now, millets, as I said, much more nutritional as compared to wheat, rice, etc. And they have the ability to grow in harsh climatic conditions. And this is where it becomes better for us. Now, the problem here is in India, most of the crops that we eat, they are not natural. Most of them are actually put through some processes. For example, how many of you, tell me uh, uh, honestly, how many of you have heard this from people that brown rice is better than white rice? How many of you have heard this concept that you should have brown rice, it's better for your health as compared to white rice? You all would have heard that, right? That yes, brown rice is better, not the white rice. Now, do you know these are the same? It's There is no difference in the way that it is being cultivated. It's nothing like that. The only difference what happens is brown rice have, has an outer coverage of bran. So brown rice, basically when rice is grown, it's brown only. It has an outer coverage of bran. When you polish that rice, you actually remove bran, then it picks up the white color, it becomes white rice. When you are removing bran, you are taking out a lot of nutritional value of bran. Bran has a lot of nutritional value. So when you are actually taking that out from the rice, you are converting it into white rice. It might taste better to you, but the problem is it is taking out a lot of good nutrition. Now, do you know some, uh, I'll tell you something very interesting, how marketing works. Please understand this. Naturally, the rice that you grow is brown rice. Okay. Then you process it, you remove the bran, you polish it, and then you convert into white rice. Meaning that, logically, what should be cheaper for someone to grow? Just try and explain this. What would be cheaper for someone to grow? Brown rice or white rice? Brown rice would be cheaper to grow, right? Why? Because you are naturally getting brown rice and you are putting it through a process, you are polishing it, you are removing the brand and you are turning it into white rice. And what is more costly in the market? Brown rice will be cheaper to produce, right? But now tell me what is costlier in the market when you go and buy brown rice versus white rice. You will have to pay much more for the brown rice. Brown rice is more expensive because that is how marketing works. Because once the marketing people put this into you that see brown rice is better for your health then even though producing brown rice was cheaper it will actually be sold to you at a higher price why because they have put this into you that see this is very very expensive this is very good for your health so this is where the difference lies the method of cultivation is not different it's just the brand, the outer covering is removed, it's polished and that is how it becomes white rice. It, be, it is much more palatable. People like the taste of white rice. People like the context of white rice. Basically, this is racism in agriculture. <laughs> in simple term, that is what racism is, right? That you think, when you're consuming it, you think, no, I'll have the white rice. Why? Because it has better taste, it has better texture. But in reality, it was actually the brown rice that was healthier for you. Anyways. Don't write this in the examination, okay? Don't use these words in the exams. This is just for your understanding. So basically, as I said, what happened? There are different types of millets. Millets have a lot of nutritional value, as you all know. 
proteins, fibers, carbs, amino acids, all of these. Now, millets also have different parts. I will just show you the diagram as well. If you see this diagram, there are different parts of millets. There is endosperm, there is this outer coverage that is a bran. So there are different parts having different important nutrition in all of these parts. For example, endosperm is the largest part of the kernel, which is a storage center. It has a lot of proteins. It is poor in mineral matter, but it does have certain proteins. So you don't have to, and I'm not expecting you to remember all the different parts of millets, but this is just to show you there are different parts of millets and all of these have different nutritional components. The outermost coverage, as you see, is a bran. Once this is removed through polishing, the color of that millet, the color of that particular grain will also change. Now, as I said, usually you cannot consume raw millets. You have to process it because raw millets might not really taste good, might not really be good enough to cook in the kitchen. So there are certain processing methods that have to be used. Now, the processing can change a lot of things in the millets. The more you process, the lower will be the nutritional value. The more you are processing it, the more you are converting it into something artificial. But there are some processes that you require. For example, first, husk is removed from the grain because a human body cannot digest it. So that is the first part. Husk, the outermost coverage that is removed. This husk is the one, if you know, which is then uh, burnt that leads to a lot of pollution in Delhi, North India. So this is the same husk that is removed, that is the outermost layer. It is removed because you can't, uh, your body will not be able to digest it. Second common step is to decorticate the grain. That is, remove the outer cover and expose the seed. The seed has to be exposed. After that, you take this to remove other impurities, including the bran. So this is the third stage where the bran is removed. This is when the color will also change. Maybe if they, if they used to be brown rice, it will then get converted to white rice. The last step is usually the polishing part. Now, polishing part is where a lot of these nutrients are lost. You tell me how many of you have seen the ad of Tata Sampan. This is a company that sells pulses and uh, uh, different types of spices, etc. Have you seen this Tata Sampan ad? Uh, yeah, by Sanjeev Kapoor. What is this ad? What do they say in the ad? They say unpolished dal, unpolished pulses, unpolished chana, unpolished this and that. So they are marketing themselves as unpolished. Why? Because of this reason. Because when you polish anything, when you are polishing it, when you are polishing your pulses, dal, whatever nutrients, it might look better to the eye. It looks more shiny. It looks more sophisticated. But the problem is by polishing it, you are actually removing a lot of its important nutrients. Again, this is not a ad or sponsored video from Tata Sampan. I hope it was. But it was not. it's not a sponsored video. So I'm not saying that you should buy this. I'm just giving an example of how they actually tell the people that polishing is bad and how polishing can actually help you. So this is the impact of polishing as you can see. It removes some weight of the grain as well. It also removes 60 to 80 percent of iron, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, manganese, etc. That is why when you say that I have my own farm. So a lot of people, for example, in the US, a lot of rich people grow products in their own farm and they consume that only. This is the reason why because they don't want these processing, polishing, etc. to take place. This is where we actually have polishing as a negative concept. Polishing can make the thing look good, but in the end, it would actually reduce a nutritional value to a large extent. These are some of the other things that you must know about millets. It is usually grown in the Kharif season, that is June to September. The good part is it can be grown over those land pieces as well, where we do not have a very high fertility rate. You can grow it even when the soil is not very fertile. You can even grow it when you do not have a lot of water supply. Uh, this is not something that you have to remember. This is just for your general information. 
millets is not just one single grain millets has a lot of different grains sorghum pearl millet uh, kodu millet all these are part of millets and all these have different type of nutritional value some are good in dietary fiber some are good in starch fat minerals calcium etc so you can make a note of this as well this also tells you which millet is good in which particular mineral again i don't think remembering all of this would be feasible or would be possible so you can read a bit about it it is expected that there may be a question asked on the millets either in the prelims or in the mains examination considering there have been multiple articles written on it considering it is the international year of millets so if you are preparing for 2023 or even 2024 make sure that you do your research about millets make your notes and read about that also while india is the largest producer of millets in the world what about the other countries apart from india most of the millet as you can see is grown in africa so there is niger 12% of the world's millet, Mali 6%, Nigeria 7%, Sudan also 9%. In our neighboring country, there is China. But if you leave out India and China, most of the other countries that produce considerable amount of millet, that actually goes into or goes from Africa only. This was our second topic today about the millets. Let me take up a few comments. It can also mitigate the problem of export of water, I mean with rice. See, it can, but the problem is no government can forcefully change the eating pattern of people. Government cannot forcefully tell you from tomorrow only have millets, not rice. It, these are something that people on an individual level have to do. So if you think that yes, you can consume millets, yes, it, in the long run it would be better. The government of India is trying to give a push to millet, but it's something that is an acquired taste. Akshad Mal Mali is a name of a country, man, not a, not the gardener. Mali is a name of an African country. Okay, then uh, some people are saying India stepped back from being a member of RCEP because of the threat from Ch Australian dairy sector. No, <laughs> see, we do have an issue with Australian dairy sector, but if you see India already has a free trade agreement with Australia. So if it would have been mainly due to Australia, then we would not have had a free trade agreement with them specifically. Yes, we do have a problem with dairy sector of Australia and New Zealand. But now that we do have a free trade agreement, we have made those exceptions here. Uh, then I have a question. Sandeep is saying any government scheme to make people aware about such polishing issue. See, there are articles written in the newspaper about polishing being bad. If general people don't read the newspaper, what will the government do? So, whatever I'm telling you is from an article only, right? So it's not that polishing and all these things are dark secrets. Everyone knows that this is true. Tata Sampan is spending so much money in the ads to tell you that polishing is bad. What else do you want from the government? So, government, see the word polishing itself would anyways be able to or should tell you that it is not really natural and you should avoid it. But the problem is when you're eating something, you also want it to look good. When you're buying something, you want it to be shiny. This is where polishing actually comes into help. Madan polishing, remove a brand. No, Madan polishing is not just removal of brand. It also adds texture. It also puts a bit of shine. Removal of brand is one part of polishing. It's not the only part. Narendra is saying, how can we use fast food industry in publicizing millets? So there are some recipes of millets that are being used now. These are being made or these are becoming slightly more popular now. But again, the problem is over our uh, over the past few years, over the past decades, because we have so much or we have consumed so much rice, wheat, we are used to rice and wheat cooked dishes that we do not really go ahead and opt for millets also. So it is a change that will happen very gradually. You can't force the government, you can't expect the government to force what change what is happening in your kitchen. So it is something that the people itself have to start doing. Okay, let's go ahead then. The next article that we have is here about a three parent baby. Someone tells me it was discussed yesterday as well. 
if that is the case it will be a good revision for you as well perfect so it is in the news because we just saw in uk we had a baby born the baby was a three parent baby so how does it work the idea is very simple it's not that complicated just let's just try and understand what is the issue all about so basically if you look at the cell cell has a lot of different components the one component that we are focusing on is mitochondria So in simple terms, since cell has many of different components, everyone, every of these, every one of these components have a different function. Mitochondria provides power to the cell. It is the powerhouse of the cell. Okay. So what happens is if there is a female suffering from a mitochondrial disease, mitochondrial disease means in simplest of terms, her cell is not getting enough power that is required for mitochondria. When you don't have enough power, the problem is that you are not able to develop the organs of the child as much as you should. It can lead to a lot of diseases. So if the mother of the child, if the female has a mitochondrial disease, in simple term, mitochondria is not producing enough power, there is a good chance that the disease will then pass on to the next generation, the child that is born. So now what can happen if the mother does not want her mitochondria especially to go on in the child? What will happen? Mitochondria will be taken from a third person. This is why it's called a three parent baby. That is the only thing that you have to understand. Mitochondria is faulty. So the mother's mitochondria can't be used. So what we will do from the cell, we will remove mitochondria. We will put some other person, some other female's mitochondria over there. And that is how we will make the egg and then the baby will be born. This is the simplest definition that you can get. It is all about mitochondria. So as and when you can remove mitochondria, put in the mitochondria of any other female, this is how it actually works. Now, please remember, the baby will be born in the womb of the mother only. It's not that the baby is being born in some other female's body. No, the baby is being born in the biological mother only. The only difference is the mitochondria is taken from the third person. That is how it becomes a three person or three parent baby. Also, no, this is not surrogacy. Yeah. This is not surrogate. Surrogacy will be when it is given or when the baby is born in the womb of some other person. So as I said, since baby carries the DNA of the parents, in most cases, most certainly the mitochondrial disease will pass on to the baby itself. And that is why, because you don't want that, because faulty mitochondria can lead to a lot of issues. See, you may assume cell is extremely small, even inside the smell cell, it's just about a mitochondria, but just having a dysfunctional mitochondria can give you a lot of issues in multiple organs. It can include brain damage, organ failure, wastage of muscles, so muscles not being strong enough. This is why it's extremely important that you identify it first and then you make sure that you can actually cure this. Now, this technology that is having a three parent baby is not a new technology. The first three parent baby, for example, was born in 2016. So the three parent baby is not a very new technology. But remember, in these kind of technologies, these are very rare occurrences. For example, if a baby of this kind was born in UK a few days back, it becomes news around the entire world. So remember, although the technology is about seven years old now, but it's not that common that you can actually see it being used time and time again. So as I said, the step by step process is that the mitochondrial diseases, since they are passed on to the next generation by the mother, the researchers used the father's sperm to fertilize the egg. The egg is from the biological mother only. The only difference is the mitochondria is taken from a third person that is a female donor. So that female donor, mother parent, they are together called the three parents. The final product that is a fertilized egg is again put back into the womb of the mother only, the biological mother. This process is called mitochondrial donation treatment. So the mitochondria will be transplanted to the original biological mother. As per the experts, it might have certain side effects. For example, it is possible that small amount of maternal mitochondria 
they may get or may have some errors while being passed on. Because these kind of technologies are still in the evolving stage, there will always be an issue of certain kind of an error that might come into picture. This is why it has not become extremely common. This is how a three parent embryo or a three parent baby is born. Please remember this is not the same as surrogate mother. Surrogate mother would be the one that would give birth to the baby. In this case, you are only taking the mitochondria from the donor and nothing else. Do remember this is a big difference. Now, if you can see mitochondria itself has a lot of different components. Mitochondria also contains some DNA. There is an inner membrane, outer membrane, there is a ribosome inside it and there is ATP as well which are the carriers of the energy. This is how mitochondria usually works. Also, a bit of information about mitochondria. Uh, these are some of the basic things that you study in general science. People usually skip the general science part whenever they are preparing for the UPSC examination. I would suggest not to do that. There are some very basic questions asked from general science in the prelims examination. So, just read 8th, 9th, 10th NCRT where you will get some basic information about biology, physics and chemistry. This is some information about mitochondria that can come very handy. For example, they are the powerhouse of the cell. They produce energy rich molecules. This is also inherited maternally in most of the organisms. Please do read about this again. Especially those who are not from science background tend to ignore science completely. That is general science part. Please remember the science syllabus of UPSC is science and technology which is separate where you read defense, space, etc. Then there's a part of general science. In general science part, you have to read basics of biology, physics and chemistry. These kind of questions are asked. Also, if you are planning to, let's assume, ignore uh, the part of general science, out of the three biology, chemistry, physics, if you are planning to ignore them, my suggestion would be at least read biology. Because mostly in every three, four years, there may be one question from general science in biology. Mostly physics and chemistry questions are not asked. For example, a few years back, there was a very simple question about difference between uh, plant cell and animal cell. Very basic question that you can solve very easily if you have read the basics. So from general science part, biophysics, chemistry, if you are planning to just skip that part, at least read a bit about bio basics. You can leave the physics chemistry part that is not really asked very often, but the bio part may be asked. So about these kind of things, whenever they remain in the news, these are important. Please do not ignore that. This was about the third means article. Before I go to the prelims specific, let me quickly take up a few questions. Kishan is saying, in accelerate wave of moral cultural orthodoxy, do you think three parent baby would be acceptable in India? See, three parent baby is not a is not something that you do by choice. It's something that you do by force. So, I don't think it's about acceptable or unacceptable. I think if it's something that's a medical procedure, it would be allowed. In India, we already have a very long tradition of surrogacy in different ways. I don't think. We have so many IVF clinics. I don't think that would be an issue, but you're because you're not doing it out of choice. This is something that you have to do for the safety of your child. Ajay saying, what is the effect on second women without mitochondria? <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing. You are not taking the entire body's mitochondria. The body has billions and millions of cells. You're not taking the mitochondria out of every cell. So don't worry that there will be no effect on the donor. Yes. Hello and good morning. Thank you for joining in after 40 minutes. Please don't spam the chat. Um, then I have a question. Kinaya Singh suggests a NCRT for basic science. As I said, NCRT 8th to 10th. 8th to 10th. If you are not really happy with physics and chemistry, read at least questions related to uh, or topics related to bio. That would be good enough. And I'm telling this because every 3 4 years you will get one question. And it's a very basic question. And the problem with basic questions is even if you get it wrong, most people will get it right. And then it creates a difference between you and the others. They will get plus two, you will not. So at least do this part. Uh, no Komal, not male mitochondrial donor. No, that will not be suitable. Can transmission of HIV from mother to child be avoided? 
I wish I was that good in science, so I don't know. You'll have to bring some scientists to answer that. Uh, Nikki saying biology class 12th is enough. I don't think you need to go till class 12th for general science. Up till class 10th is good enough. You don't have to go more than that. Up till class 10th, good enough. Rakhi saying what is the reason for mitochondria not producing power? <laughs> some, some defect in the body with the scientists also are researching about. So I don't know. If I knew I would have told you the answer but I wish I knew. Anyway, let's go ahead then. We now, because the questions are getting too uh, scientific, it's going way beyond me. It's, we have to bring a scientist to answer these questions. Let's now go ahead and take up some of the topics from the prelims point of view. So from the prelims point of view, there are a few very important news stories. The first one, the government has released the fourth positive indigenization list for the defense public sector undertakings. Now, what exactly is this? In simple terms, what the government has done is government in the past has been releasing a list of those weapons and equipments which our armed forces now cannot buy from outside India. This is called the positive list. So positive indigenization list means these kind of products will be manufactured in India only by Indian companies and the armed forces will buy it from India. There, ha there were three such lists that were published earlier. Now this is the fourth list. It has about eight, 928 items and every year the government will save about 715 crore rupees from this. Now you don't have to remember these items. Just remember this is the fourth such list that has come up. It is in line with the government's plan to have our defense sector dependent more within India rather than be dependent on outside India. It's also about the government not willing to spend a lot of foreign exchange to buy weapons. This is the government's initiative under the Make in India. Now there are other defense related initiatives as well. As you know, the government of India has been trying to give a push to defense export. Recently, for the first time ever, we have touched 10,000 crore rupees of export in defense. Now, please understand 10,000 crore rupees of export in defense might seem like a big number, but in the context of how costly these weapons are, it's not a very big number if you compare it with the bigger countries. But still, it is a good beginning for India. Reaching the 10,000 crore mark is something that India is looking forward to. Also, apart from this, remember, it depends on what exactly are you exporting. In defense, for example, the costliest things, the costliest things usually are aircrafts, fighter aircrafts mainly, submarines, these are extremely expensive. Then apart from that, you have aircraft carrier. These are usually the most expensive things. Now out of these, what India is doing is number one, India is trying to ensure that our Tejas becomes famous. India has been putting applications we are filling up a lot of different countries proposals to sell Tejas submarines India is really not there right now with Tejas what has happened is I'll give you an example uh, a few months back Egypt the Egyptian government they released a contract and they invited other countries they said that we want to buy some light combat aircraft everyone so a lot of countries filled this form that we would like to sell it to them then they eliminated some of the aircrafts in the end, Egypt had to decide between two aircrafts. One was Tejas and other was a South Korean aircraft. Uh, unfortunately, they decided to go ahead with the South Korean aircraft. So Tejas just lost out. But it was still a big thing that Tejas reached the top two final list from Egypt on which aircraft would they actually want to buy. So it was a very good thing for India that we are making a lot of important strides there. Because again, see selling of smaller items like selling of, uh, for example, uh, we have, we do give some helicopters, etc. We do give some other uh, Renegus aircraft. We do give some other kind of equipment, but these are not that expensive. Yes, Brahmo's missile, Brahmo's missile, again, one missile is not as expensive as an aircraft would be. Or a missile is not expensive as submarines, etc. would be. There is a difference between the two. For example, India is just buying five S-400 missile defense system from Russia. That has gone into billions of dollars. Just buying five of those would be billions and billions of dollars. So that is the difference between high ticket cost item and low ticket cost. So Tejas, if we 
make it good enough to be exported to other parts of the world that will be a big win for India yes Brahmos is also very important but again big ticket items make a huge difference so government of India has been trying to improve that as well apart from that what have we done in the defense sector we have increased the FDI limit to 74 percent so foreign direct investment is invited ordnance factory boards have also become much much more efficient there used to be 41 ordnance factories now they are under seven boards we also have been inviting different types of ideas in the field of defense innovation we also have something called the srijan portal srijan portal is for those vendors in india who are trying to get the help of the government to produce something in the defense sector we also have the ebis portal to apply for industrial licenses in the defense sector these are just some of the initiatives that the government has taken in the defense sector specifically the next important article uh, is that india now has a new cbi director the dgp of karnataka mr praveen sood has been promoted and will join as the cbi director now as you know the cbi director is appointed on recommendation of a three member committee these three members are the prime minister leader of opposition in the lok sabha and the chief justice of india remember by the way this committee is used for recommending other appointments which are the other ones which are the other appointments which are done by the same committee what do you think or they just appoint the cbi director election commission it was in the news it was in the news election commission appointment process was changed recently election commission appointment again is done by this three member committee now as a cbi director he would get a two year term he was supposed to retire in about one year from now but it will be extended because if you become a cbi director you need to get a two year term so there are a few things that you need to know about the cbi director's appointment first what if there is no leader of opposition present what if the opposition party doesn't have 10 percent seat so there is no official leader of opposition then what do you do what do you do is you actually have the leader of the single largest opposition party also the supreme court in 2019 has said that the officer who doesn't have six months remaining before retirement should not become the cbi chief please remember the supreme court has said an officer the ips officer who does not have six months remaining before the retirement should not be taken for this position that is the cbi director also the cbi director has been now assured a two-year tenure this is by the cvc act of 2003 i would suggest you to go ahead and read about the Vineet Narayan case. Take out some time today, read about the Vineet Narayan case. This is with relation to the CBI. Read about what exactly did the Vineet Narayan case say? What did the Supreme Court say about the CBI and the Vineet Narayan case? What happened? Why was the Vineet Narayan case important? And why Vineet Narayan specifically is important? Vineet Narayan very famous journalist still alive still write some articles in the indian express etc there was a very famous case in the case 1997 do read about that it is extremely important will tell you what the government of india was doing with the cbi and what did the court say about cbi the last article for today is from the front page of the hindu newspaper the supreme court has again expanded the ambit of article 21 as you know article 21 anyways has a lot of things included now the Supreme Court has said that if a bail order given by a court is too long or the bail order is delayed for a long time that will also lead to violation of the fundamental right of personal liberty. Now there was a case in which the Bombay High Court recently gave a bail order of 16 pages that why bail will not be given and also the Bombay High Court took three months to actually give this decision so they had decided and then they reserved the order do you know what is reserve the order you might have seen this phrase many times 
reserve the order. Reserve the order means a court has decided, but they are not telling you, they will just contemplate, they will form the proper order and they will say, okay, we are reserving the order, we will tell you after a few days. But reserve the order again can be done for a few days. In Bombay High Court case, they reserved the order for bail for three months and then they denied it. Supreme Court was unhappy with this. Supreme Court said that it should not take any court so much time in deciding the bail. Bail matter is not such a complicated matter where you can actually take such a long time. Supreme Court said that denying bail on such long grounds, giving such a long explanation is against a person's personal liberty. Now there are different types of bails that you might have heard about. There is something called the interim bail, regular bail and something called the anticipatory bail. Interim bail as the name says, it's a temporary bail where the higher court asks for more documents to take the final decision. So you apply for bail, the court says, okay, we are giving you bail, but this is not the final one. We are just adjudicating the matter. Let us discuss this more. We'll take a few days, but till then, in interim bail, you can go out. This is interim bail, not the final one. Regular bail, as I said, again is when you're accused of minor crimes, you can come out of prison. This is mainly done if it is sure that you will not interfere in the investigation. Third one is the anticipatory bail. Anticipatory bail is when a person thinks or believes that I will be arrested in the future. So without waiting for the police to come and arrest you, without waiting for anything, you just go ahead and ask for the bill that is anticipatory bill that I'm anticipating I will be arrested. Question on anticipatory bail was asked by the UPSC earlier. So please make sure that you do remember about this. Also, here are a few things about how Article 21 has been expanded. As I said, Article 21 has been expanded time and time again. Now, Supreme Court has said that even giving or denying bail for a long time can also lead to Article 21 being violated. Today's homework, we are on the last slide, so let this be today's homework for you. Today's homework is try and research how right to sleep became a part of Article 21. It's a pretty interesting case. Just research about how right to sleep became a part of Article 21. It is a part of Article 21. You have the right to sleep. So next time your mom comes on a Sunday at 10 a.m. to wake you up, you can tell her, please go away. It is my fundamental right to sleep under Article 21. What happens after that is your responsibility. But right to sleep is your fundamental right. Please do search about that. Let me know in the comment section after the video ends. How is right to sleep a fundamental right? What was the case exactly? Why is this case interesting? Please search about that. If not, we will discuss that in tomorrow's CNA. This brings me to the end of today's discussion. There are a couple of practice questions that you have here from the mains examination point of view. First question on the three parent baby and second question is about India not willing to sign a lot of these free trade agreements. Try and write answer to these in, on a student portal. You can get the link to the answer writing portal in the description of the video. You can check each other's answers as well. Thank you so much for joining in. I'll see you tomorrow. Do join in right at 10 a.m. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Jai Hind.